So, uh, welcome to the presentation, New Trends in Mandoc. Um, this is kind of a continuation of the talk I have been giving here, uh, no, I gave here three years ago in BSD CAN 2011, but it ought to be self-contained, so if you missed that one, not be a problem. Today I'm focusing on enhancing the toolbox, so on new functionality that is going beyond just formatting manual pages. <laughs> well, maybe you do a bit better after this talk, maybe you don't, I don't know. That is true, that is true. So uh, I'm talking about enhancing a toolbox, so the first natural question is what is in that toolbox? which kind of tools. Um, when you think of manual pages, probably the first program you think of is the manual page viewer, MAN. It fans, finds manuals in the file system. It calls a formatter on those manuals and shows them to you. That is actually not the topic of this talk. But the formatter that it calls, MANDOC, which reads the source code in some markup languages and writes the text to you, is uh, on topic. And uh, the classical tool, by the way, that did the same is NROF. But there are some more tools in the box. One is the search tool, apropos. You probably know it also under the synonym man minus k. And the database build tool, make what is. Uh, well, I, I'll come back to that near the end of this talk. So, um, let's start with a birthday celebration. The basic syntax we are using here is based on the syntax of the ROF language. And that syntax of the ROF language has its 50th anniversary this year. When Jerry Salza prepared his thesis at MIT in 1964, he wrote the runoff program, and you still see some of the re requests he introduced, adjustment, centering, filling, line length, and so on, breaks and spacing. He introduced in 1964, they are still in use today in the rough syntax. The basic idea of that syntax is that you have most of the text just in text lines, and then here and there in between so-called macro lines, starting with a dot, starting with a period, a macro name, and maybe some arguments that influence formatting, produce additional text, whatever. Now you might wonder, a 50th anniversary is nice, but why do we still use the things in computer science after 50 years? What? Oh. Um, well, that is the slide I wanted to show to you, but somehow the formatting doesn't work. This is the source code. So you see here some of the low-level macros saying, uh, insert a bit of space here, center a few lines. But you also see high-level macros, like this is a title line up there. Here you see a list with various items. Well, let's try again. Let's look at the formatted page. If you format that, it looks like this. So the advantages of this syntax are that it can easily be hand edited with minimal typing overhead. It looks unobtrusive. It doesn't really muddle the text. If you put a few macros in between, it harmonizes very well with version control systems and with diff. It allows high quality output in multiple output formats. So for the terminal, for typesetting, for giving a talk, I'm doing all this talk and graph. Um, it works with very simple, fast, portable, readily available tools. And my favorite point about it is it doesn't need any heavyweight or cumbersome tool chains. In particular, no XML anywhere near. So uh, say it in one word, keep it stupidly simple, that works. Um, now, of course, we have to apply, you probably know the picture. Um, of course, we have to apply all that to manual pages. And the first people who did that were 
Ritchie and Thompson for the first version of the Unix, of the research Unix manuals in 1971, some of the section headers they used for the first, the very first Unix manual are still in use today. And then during the history of research Unix in the 70s, it evolved in version 4 the first high-level macros appeared that resemble what we have today. The syntax was still a bit different. And in version 7 AT&T Unix, we had the full man language that, we, that some people, in particular Linux, is still using today. So again, you might start to wonder whether there has been any progress during the last 35 years. And indeed, there has. Because at Berkeley, the Computer Systems Research Group introduced the concept of semantic markup to Unix manuals. Not just saying in, in macros, make this bold, but saying this is a title, this is a function name, this is an author's name, this is a cross-reference, whatever. That is the MDoc language. And Cynthia Livingstone of Usenix went through the ordeal of taking the whole set of BSD manuals and converting it manually from MAN to MDoc. That work was started for Reno and was finally completed for 4.4 BSD. That's why all the BSDs we have today are basically built on the same MDoc manuals. The advantages of this language are that it has considerable expressive power for semantic markup, while MAN is a purely presentation level language. And uh, what is also very important is that MAN regularly requires low level rough functionality to achieve its goals because it is an incomplete language, kind of. While when you are writing a manual in MDoc, you just need MDoc macros. You almost never need to, um, need to take any low-level ROF macros. So a self-contained language, of course, is much better than a language using the two or three or four or five languages. By the way, if you meet them, tell that to the XSLT guys. Well, um, now, for quite some time, portability was an issue because 20 years were not, were not quite enough for some operating systems, hello Solaris, to adopt MDoc. Um, this is no longer a case. You can, whatever you're doing, just write your manuals in MDoc, and I will explain in this talk how you can use MANDoc to auto-generate MAN manuals for some old-fashioned operating systems from them. Uh, but the, the main point of this talk will be improved searching facilities. But before you co we come to that, maybe a brief look at how MDoc code looks like. We've just seen ROF code with different kinds of macros. Here you see the start of the manual of the MDoc language itself. And you see it looks much more uniform. The macros all follow, follow the same style. You have a, a header with meter information. And then in the text, which is mostly just text, you have macros for cross-references or for inserting the name of the page or for a paragraph, well, whatever. It is quite easy to learn. It's 30 or so um, macros that you actually use in practice. And as Henning said, as a developer, you don't really need to bother actively learning it. You just take another page. Hopefully, they are all of good quality. JMC takes care of that. Copy it, and now and then look into the manual if you need something special. Good. So let's summarize regarding the classic documentation format, there are three things that have really proven timeless by their simplicity and their efficiency. One is the ROF input syntax. The second is the MDoc semantic markup. And the third 
is the presentation format used by the MAN program when you type MAN something. Many people have tried to come up with something better, but at least according to my opinion, no one really succeeded. Um, and I don't think that's a, con uh, a coincidence, even though the tools can certainly be improved, and that's what I'm working on and what Christaps is working on, regarding the formats, there is indeed very little that one could even wish. And that's the reason I think why nobody has come up with better languages. But these formats just do what they should. So we need modern tools for the classical formats. And uh, the modern toolbox I'm working on, actually I'm not really um, aware of any other project that is working on this task, is Mandoc. It has a number of advantages. First, it's quite functional. Everything is in one binary. You can produce ASCII or UTF output, HTML, PostScript, PDF output. You can do MDoc to MAN conversions with this tool and you have all the search functionality inside it. It's free, BSD license, no GPL code whatsoever inside. It's lightweight, it's just ANSI C and POSIX, but no C++ anywhere near. It's portable, it's small, much smaller than Graph actually. And it's fast, so for MDoc manuals, where you have to do some non-trivial parsing, it's typically five times faster than Graph, and let's not even get started about the speed of things like ASCII doc and doc book that... Uh, the problem is that you switch to that on the shitty platforms like, let's say, Mac 68K, that saves one day of build time. <laughs> right, yes, that's, that's what I explained last time three years ago. Um, Eric as Raymond and um, the, the, the top GNU guys have just agreed to replace GNU Info with uh, ASCII doc doc book for their infrastructure and they will probably be surprised as to the speed of that thing or maybe they don't care. Well, anyway, I covered the basic functionality of Mandoc and how it was integrated in the OpenBSD operating system three years ago. Um, so now Let's focus on new functionality. Um, a brief overview of what I'm talking about. The first big part of the talk is searching for manual pages where I'm talking about things like markup sensitive search, complex search queries, flexible output formats, uh, and a bit about the technology, the database implementation, the search algorithm, optimization and performance. And then in the second part, I'm, I will explain how well Mandoc has been adopted in different communities and what can be done for handling portable software, both in ports and when you're, you are the author yourself. And of course, at the end, I will give some glimpses what I might do and what Christaps is doing in the future. Okay, so uh, by the way, if, if you have any questions during the talk, don't hesitate to just speak up and uh, ask in between. How does searching work? Of course, there are quite old functionalities that we don't want to break. So this slide shows what has been working before and what, what will continue to work. If you say apropos or man minus k and some keywords, then it searches case insensitively for substrings in names and descriptions of manual pages. And Apropos has a number of options that will continue to be supported. Even the database build tool will basically work the same as it did in the past with the same options. So switching here is mostly a drop in, that is, backward compatible, but there is new functionality. Um, the example at the top asks the system, I should like to know which utilities are using the user environment variable, just as an example. And it will show you the titles of all the man pages that refer to the user environment variable. Um, there is a colorful collection of things that you can search for like cross-references or function arguments 
are uh, function return types, error constants, kernel configuration directives, which drivers attach at PCI, things like that. Who, yeah? Does that work with, with searching through bad things in port code so you use man? No. Um, of course, to search for semantically marked up content, the content must be marked up semantically in the first place. Then again, uh, there are some vague ideas. Maybe in the future it will be possible to do a bit of artificial intelligence on man manual pages and even on preformatted manual pages and guess a bit of that. But that's not really done yet. Yeah? Yes, if you specifically search for one or two of these keys, then you won't get manual pages that don't use MDoc for now. But uh, if you, you can OR it with the traditional ones, I will show that in a minute, and then you get all in one go. Um, yes? Uh, in, in the base system, it's basically, it's nearly all MDoc with a few exceptions like curses and bin utils uh, and Perl. And outside the base system in ports, almost everything is MAN. There are a few MDoc, but not very many. Okay, so intermediate new, new search features. You could always just give multiple search terms, multiple keywords, and they were odd. Now you can also or the, the keys. So if you don't quite know whether you are searching for a function argument or a function type or a variable type, you just give multiple keys with comma. Um, if you don't know at all, well, you limit. How might that be marked up? You just say any and we'll, it will search to all the keys. Um, and it now supports regular expressions. So if instead of the equal sign, you use the tilde, then your search expression will be evalu evaluated as a regular expression. So the difference between apropos new limit and apropos any equals new limit is one will give me everything, one will only give me man doc for man pages, right? No. The difference, the, the actual difference, if you really do it, is that apropos any U limit will really return you the shells because the U limit is marked up in those shell manual pages, and apropos U limit will give you nothing. Well, U limit does not appear in the name or description of any manual page. Yeah, so that that's actually a typical problem. People type man U limit and think the command doesn't exist. Well, but it does. There was a guy in the list like a week ago. Man, job, it's not there. What do I do? Oh my god. Yeah, exactly. So if you don't get any results, you just try again with apropos any glyph, uh, any equals your keyword, and then chances are better that you get something. There are still more advanced search features. Um, there have already always been options to Restrict, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, can I ask one question about yes. regular expressions? Are they good regular uh, expressions or bad regular expressions? Um, they are the bad ones. Okay. Um, they, they are those ones described in... Um, POSIX basic No, ex they are extended. They are POSIX extended because that is available in almost any operating system, and I didn't want to um, really depend on the Perl regular expression library. Well, it's widespread, but it would have been yet another dependency. If I can't express a search string as a DRE, I don't think I can do a useful one with PCRE instead. 
Yeah. Well, no. but that's a specialized question. So let, let's get to the um, to, to more features. So you could always restrict the search to a certain section of the manual or to a certain architecture with the minus s options. And these attach with and to the rest of your expression. But now you can also explicitly link search terms with and and or. And you can even use parentheses. Here I'm searching for names or descriptions that contain terminal in pages that originated either in research Unix or in traditional pre-FreeBSD Berkeley BSD and you see the very old terminal utilities. Well, Yes, the, the length is limited by whatever you, the memory of your machine or the shell can support. So that's uh, good. So, but we don't just have new features for, um, for searching. We also have new features for output. Of course, no matter what output you ask for, you always get the names of the pages, the section numbers, and the architectures. Because that's what you need to use the man command afterwards and to actually retrieve the pages. And if you say nothing special, as before, you get the description of the page after it. But you can ask for other keys instead of the description. For example, here, I searched for wireless drivers and I told it, well, I want to see the configuration directive so I can see right away where do they, these things attach. And maybe I want something for USB and not for Cardbus. And so I see which ones oh, you can. Uh, you, could, you could use, for example, uh, the standard or when it appeared in the, the operating system. So you get a list of functions and the first release in the operating system that has it. Such stuff is, is all possible. OK, so how is this all implemented? Um, in the past, the what is database was a plain text file. Now, for what you have just seen, we obviously need a structured database. But then a client-server model would really be overkill and merely a hindrance for, for such a thing. So SQLite was a natural choice. And by the way, that logo might provide a hint where all those birds are coming from. Well, I don't know exactly. Um, in, in the database, I chose to have four tables, one per physical page that contains the description of the, ta of the page. One, for the file names in the file system pointing to that page, there are often more than one. Um, and this second table, the mlinks table, has full support for hard links, for soft links, and for the um, rof.so mechanism that is used by xorg. So how, no matter how your pages are linked together, it will understand all the common formats. And then there is a third table for names, not just the file names, but all names of the manual page cited in the page itself. So you can search for a page even if it's not access under a name, even if it's not accessible through the file, name, uh, file system under that name, just if the name is cited in the page. And the fourth table is a table of key value pairs. That's a really large table because it contains all the rest of the search information. Based on these four tables, how does the search algorithm work? Whenever you issue one query, apropos something, there will be either two or three queries to the database. The first query always decides which results do you get back, which pages. Now, the good news is that as long as you search for the descriptions, which is the usual thing to do, that is very fast because the descriptions are right stored in the, uh, in the table you need. So that's not even a join query. If you search, search for the no names, it is a join. But 
it's just a simple join with a small query that's quite fast too. Only if you search for something else, it's slightly slower because it has to go into the huge keys table. Once you know I want to show these pages to the user, you have to do one second query to retrieve the names from the names table, but you already have the page ID, so the names table is indexed according to the page ID, so that's a simple um, select on an index which takes almost no time. And if you want to s display the descriptions, you already have them from the first step, so you're done here. If you want to display anything else except the descriptions, then you have to do another quick indexed select by page ID from the keys table, and those are the three steps. What did we optimize? When optimizing, you usually want a lot of things. You want a small database, you want a short database build time, you want quick searches, and you want low memory consumption when the search tool is running. And of course, some of these goals conflict, so optimization needs some trade-offs which are not really mathematically well-defined. In any case, the profiler program was quite useful for doing, for doing all this. Let's start with search speed. Um, there were four main optimizations that really helped. Moving the descriptions from where all the other search information is to the pages table gave me a factor of four in speed for searches by descriptions. Similarly, moving the names, which are also very often searched for, out of the um, keys table into their own dedicated table also gave me a factor of four in speed for searches by names. Adding indexes to the mlinks table sped up the second search step, the searching for the names, by a factor of 20. Now this is the smaller of the steps in the algorithm, so the, the overall time just decreased by about 30%. But anyway, um, if you are, get very many results, that can get more important. Like if you are searching for something like string and get 100 results. Um, similarly, there was a large factor adding an index to the keys table. And finally, a bit more compl complicated, if you give SQLite a page, a pre-allocated page cache, that speeds up searches too, and it even reduces overall memory consumption, RAM consumption, because it does less um, malloking if you do it well. Now, so, so much about speed optimizations of the search tool. What about speed optim optimization of the database build? You might wonder why is this even relevant? I don't care whether it takes long or not to build the database. Well, maybe you don't care. But one thing we definitely don't want to do in OpenBSD is slow down development. When developers are building the system, it should be fast or they won't go on developing because this stuff is built during regular system builds. So first thing I did was introduce a, t a quick mode where parsing is aborted right after the name section. Of course, then you get reduced databases, just like if everything was written in MAN. But that doesn't really matter during the system build. When you, have, when you install the system, you run, it, you run the database tool once and have your full database and fine. Um, that gave a factor 2 in speed and 4 in size. And then, of course, not syncing too often, but building the full database and then syncing to disk, well, that's obvious. And there is a quite long list of small optimizations that were found to be useful with the profiler and that don't actually only help when building databases, but they, as a side effect, they also speed up displaying manuals because mandoc is run each time you type man. And taking all together, they sum up a bit. I won't go through all of them now. Yes? So the preformat is gone? No. 
Uh, well, yes, I will come to that. So um, pre-formatted manual pages, if they, you install them, still work. They are also used by the database and search tools but the basis, some of the base systems don't use them by default. I will come to more, more details later. So what about database size? I did some optimizations there, but they were not just as effective, mostly because the database format Christop started out with wasn't that redundant to start with. One thing that is quite interesting is that very small things can sometimes have considerable effect just by sorting the, sort, the, 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 sorting the search keys by frequency, um, the effect is that you get, on average, smaller integers for the indexes in the database. And that results in a 10% reduction of database size. It's amazing, but such things happen. You really have to play around a bit, and then you get improvements. Well, let me summarize on the performance. With the old plain text apropos, a simple search took about 10 milliseconds on moderately old hardware like my notebook. With the new SQLite apropos, obviously it has to be slower because there is SQL overhead and the names are now physically separated from the descriptions. Now it takes about 40 milliseconds. But, frankly, that difference is not really of practical re uh, relevance, even on moderately uh, old hardware, and certainly not on your notebook. So, what about database size? The old database size was uh, 250 kilobytes. No doubt, uh, Dennis Ritchie would have been uh, quite concerned growing that to 900 kilobytes, or if you enable file functionality to 4 megabytes. So I must admit, having more information means storing a bit more information, but I have checked with people like Mio and Nick, and we agree that it is not really a practical problem on any of our architectures. Though what... what the rest of us is even asking about cases. <laughs> right. Um, what is nice is that during system builds, the database build time when running in the quick mode is reduced by a factor of three. So you, get, you don't get the file functionality, but a slightly better database, and it is even built faster because we are now doing it in C and not in, in Perl, and we are aborting the pars earlier. Yeah. I consider this, that question valid. It would be a trade-off of database size versus search speed, but I admit that I have not investigated yet. That would be a thing that could be useful to do. Are we talking about 4 megabytes in the feature mode? What are we talking about? OK, let's talk about something else. Maybe <laughs> Henning is right. That's, that's a third of the kernel. <laughs> yes. OK. so. Uh, we have seen that the thing itself, in itself is a bit useful. Let's see whether there are any useful byproducts. We are going, when building this database, we are going through all the manuals anyway. So while looking at the manuals, we can as well consider whether what we see makes any sense in the first place, because just because you see something, it isn't really sure whether it is true or not. Um, we can find, when running with the right options, we can find things like mismatching section numbers. So the, the section directory the page is stored in doesn't agree with the section number given in the manual, or the architecture's mismatch, or even worse, 
um, the page is stored under a certain file name, but that file name is not actually the name of the manual page given in the manual. Um, there are some such checks are already done by the old Mac, what is, but the new one is doing a few more. Of course, that's not enabled during builds because you don't want noise there. Um, besides, I have started doing direct inspection of the database with the SQL Lite command line tool to catch markup errors in pages. Well, you, I can just look at the keys table and see whether what is stored for the various keys you have seen makes any sense or not. Uh, actually, a lot of that work has been done during the New Zealand hackathon this January. And that's maybe another hint where all those New Zealand birds could come from. Uh, but regarding this consistently checking, no doubt a lot can be done later. What I've done so far is just the start. Good. Now, it's quite probable that some of you think, well, that's weird. It's certainly an academic exercise. Certainly nobody is using that. That's not quite true. In OpenBSD, as I already explained last time I gave a talk here three years ago, Mandoc is the only documentation formatter in the base system for three years. And I'm speaking about stable releases, not about current. So in OpenBSD current, three years of Mandoc in the stable releases as the only formatter. And now since this April, we are using the new search tool by default in OpenBSD current. So when we release OpenBSD 5.6 this autumn, it will contain all the functionality I have shown by default for everybody. The next best system regarding Mandoc adoption is NetBSD. NetBSD has done a huge leap about two years ago, where they have decided, and that's where I'm coming back to one of the questions that were asked, to install source manual pages by default, just like OpenBSD does, and format them on the fly when you type man with mandoc. So in NetBSD, the default formatter, real-time formatter, is mandoc for two years now. And they are also using a special search tool, which is called Make MakeMandiB. It has been written by Abhinav Upadhyay during a Google Summer of Code. Uh, the, the good thing about that is that it's featuring full text search, leveraging the special infrastructure SQLite has for that. But the bad thing is that he completely neglected to use any of the semantic formatting. So NetBSD, apropos, can't do any semantic searching. Yes? So can OpenBSD's Mandoc toolkit do full text searching today? No. Okay. I deliberately didn't do that because when I tried the first time about two years ago to get uh, this whole thing going and into OpenBSD, it was a miserable failure because performance was just abysmal. It slowed down builds, it slowed down searching. So I said, in the first step, I'm really making sure that it is better than what we have in every respect, both functionality and performance. And no doubt, adding a full text search database will make it bigger and slower. I, I admit I didn't measure what the performance in NetBSD is, but that would be another task for the future. But uh, I will talk about a bit at the end what I'm going to do in the future. This is probably not top priority, but it might be worth looking at too. Yeah. OK, so a NetBSD with um, mostly relying on Mandoc was released in 2012, NetBSD 6.0, but no semantic searching. The situation in FreeBSD and Dragonfly is not that bad either. FreeBSD 10.0, released this January, contains Mandoc by default. So um, 
I talked to two FreeBSD developers during this conference and told them, oh, type, type Mandoc on your um, notebook. And they said, oh, no, that's no use. I haven't installed it. Well, you don't need to. It's on by default. Um, in Dragonfly, Mandoc is contained in stable releases for four years now. But in both, it is not used by default for anything yet. Um, and semantic searching is not supported. So it, it includes an older ver a slightly older version of Mandoc that doesn't have SQLite integration yet. Um, not because it's, um, the maintainers are neglecting it, but just because there is no upstream release yet containing the SQLite stuff. Status in non-BSD systems is that there is one system that has, yes, there is one system that is not BSD that has a Mandoc in base for a long time. It's admittedly somewhat apathetic. They never updated it. Um, Alpine Linux, is that's a distribution focusing on small size and simplicity, has a port for almost four years. Arch Linux just got a new maintainer who has also ported it to Debian and is aiming to port it to all the major distributions. PKG source um, is quite useful. That's the packaging tool of NetBSD, which is portable and helps to get it onto many systems. In particular, it has been tested on Solaris and macOS. So let's summarize adoption. In OpenBSD, it's the only documentation formatter in base for three years and also enabled for searching. In NetBSD, default formatter for two years. Dragonfly and FreeBSD both have it in base and consider switching to it as the default formatter. Minix has it. It's tested on Linux, Solaris, macOS. It also runs on HP, Unix, IX, whatever, via PKG source. So I don't think it is an exer exaggeration to say that it has gained a lot of traction in all the BSDs and even somewhat beyond. So much about searching and adoption. Uh, given this situation, I think it makes sense to devote the rest of the talk to topics of porting and portability. And there are uh, regarding manual pages, of course. There are two perspectives you can use. One perspective is you say, I'm a FreeBSD guy. I have this given operating system, and now all kinds of crazy people are writing all kinds of crazy software that somebody may want to run. So that's porting. You don't know what crappy kinds of man pages you get. You certainly know the law of feature creep. If some software contains some functionality, somebody will use it. And the corollary to man pages, of course, is that no matter how weird and irrelevant for manual pages a feature of Roth or a Groth extension is, somebody will use it. Now, Mandoc is not a complete Roth implementation. And I'm not sure it will ever be. That's not a problem in the base system, because if there you have a weird manual, you can patch it, it's your own, or you can add the one feature you are lacking to Mandoc. Either case, it works. But in ports, you, cannot, you just cannot say Mandoc or nothing, because then you end up with some ports that have unusable manuals. So you need something. The OpenBSD strategy to solve that is to first make sure that no port using the build target tries to format manuals, but instead make sure that every port during the fake install target installs the source manuals, no matter whatever Mando can or cannot do with them. For most ports, you are done at that point. You just let the, port, the packaging system install the source pages, fine. But for the few, where Mando cannot or cannot yet handle the manuals, you set a special boolean make variable in the make file, the port make file, in OpenBSD that is called use graph. And then you make sure that the framework, the ports framework, 
formats the manuals using graph, which is then build dependency on the fly, and puts the pre-formatted pages into the package. Um, that will work just fine because the pre-formatted manuals installed will just be displayed by MAN directly and the unformatted, the source manuals installed are just those where the porters have already checked that MANDOC can handle them. For in uh, the example of OpenBSD has a, a bit less than 8,000 ports thousand of them are still using this variable use graph. Probably for quite some of them it could be removed, but you should do manual checks before removing that variable. We have been doing that for three years now, removing the variable from about 3,000 perts. There's not really a hurry. That work is ongoing. We make sure that manuals work in every port. Um, this whole concept has been developed and implemented by Mark SP and has, it has proven very sturdy and very easy to use. So if any system is considering switching the default formatter from, man, uh, from Graph to Mandoc, I strictly recommend that approach for the port side. It's, it's proven, you just need to build the same thing and you are done with it. Now, Yes, Mandoc contains a parser for pre-formatted pre pages that is not extracting a lot of information, but it is extracting the name and the description. So, apropos, basic apropos function, functionality works without the user even noticing whether it's formatted or unformatted, it just works. Um, I've been talking about searching, now you could Ask yourself whether there are any implications of make what is and apropos for parts. Um, the point is packages get installed and deinstalled. So, of course, the system administrator could w wait for the weekly um, make what is rebuild run to update the databases. But a better approach is during the package installation to dynamically add the new manual pages to the database and during package removal to remove them from the database. That has been done routinely on OpenBSD for a very long time also with the old make what is. And it also works transparently with the new one. So you install a new package, you run apropos right afterwards and it gives you the fr freshly installed manual pages. There are also a few other features of make what is that help most in parts. One, to handle pre-formatted manuals, we talked about that. Second, um, it natively supports gzip manual pages. Make what, I think that is important for FreeBSD. And in case it ever happens that you tell the database build tool, please add this page to that database, and the database is corrupt or not even present, it, the database will be regenerated on the fly. That's useful for stuff that has its own manual page hierarchies, like a TCL port, for example. Now, what about the reverse perspective? So far, we have been the FreeBSD guys who poured all kinds of software. Now, let's take the position of the maintainer of one piece of software. Say, the two, I'm Todd Miller now, the pseudo maintainer. I want to distribute the manuals for my program pseudo, but I have no idea what people will run that program on. Yeah? Sorry, going back to the previous page. Yes. Actually, I don't use the man path environment variable ever. ever. I do support it, 
But what I do is just making sure that the file etcman.conf is correct, that it references the right directories, and then make what is will transparently uh, consult that file and use the databases in those No, wait. You 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 have one database per directory. Yeah, you have you have one database in user share man for the base system manuals. That almost never changes because you don't install and deinstall base system things. And then you have another one for the for the port things, and that is the one that changes. No, not really, because if you are installing and deinstalling TCL modules, then this path will be different. That's yes, point. that's the point. It could store those passes in the etc man passes or .com or .com. Oh, yes. The problem a different way. But I didn't have to with the man passes manually. My yeah. biggest complaint about installing ports in OpenBSD is that I must edit man.com. OK. It's never obvious how to edit it correctly. Yes, yes. Yes. If we extend the database to include the full paths, can we not just throw that whole problem out the window? I, I have considered uh, redesigning the, the man conf concept. Um, and I will, I've taken a note. That's a new perspective that should be, uh, should be used when doing that, yes. But. We had to. We would. We would have to consider how to handle that situation. Yes, but it's probably the, the talk is not the right place to really think that through. But it's an interesting idea. Yes. Okay. So reverse perspective. Uh, I'm now Todd Miller. I'm trying to distribute some. Uh, some portable software, but I have no idea whatsoever what kind of weird software, uh, systems people might use that on. So the traditional problem is, of course, I want to use the best tools there are. So I want to write my manual pages in MDoc. But then some people will lose because they don't have MDoc. Now, what Todd did in the past was use worse tools, write his manuals using MAN. He stopped doing so. But uh, then everybody loses. He loses because he has to, to use the weird man syntax. And all the people having modern systems lose too because they can't use semantic search and whatever. So that would be a very bad idea. But MANDOC now rescues you from that situation. You just write the manual pages using MDOC. And then in the build system for your tarballs, you do an automatic conversion. And at configure time, when the stuff is installed, you let configure select the right thing. Actually, I announced sudo as a walkthrough case study when proposing this talk um, because I figured there would be quite some things to apply, explain. You need to do this and you need to do that. And then when preparing the talk, I ended up putting it all on one slide. It's so simple. You just need to do two things. The one thing is in the build system for the distribution table. You just have two targets. One converts the MDoc handwritten thing to the MAN auto-generated thing with MANDOC minus T MAN. The other one formats it completely to a pre-formatted manual, just as MAN would do using MANDOC. And that's all you need to do for building your distribution table. You put all of them into the distribution table. Now, in the installation system, everything can be handled by configure. 
um, if configure finds the mandoc binary on the system, you are done. You just use the mdoc pages. If it doesn't find mandoc, you look for ROF. If that's not available either, you are done. You just do the preformat pages. Now, if you do find nrof, you just test whether mdoc works. If it does, you use mdoc. If it doesn't, you use man, and again, you are done. There is nothing more to it. And that's exactly how it's done when you install portable sudo anywhere. Yes. Yes. If if we have some time at the end, I could show you some examples. This. Yeah. Okay. So let's go on. How is this implemented? Maybe some of you remember that the Mandoc program consists of two parts: parsers constructing in-memory tree structures, node structures, and then formatters, formatting output from those structures. What the mdoc to man converter does is do the first step, run the parsers, create those in-memory structures, and then produce man output directly from that. Admittedly, there would, be, would have been the alternative way to convert the mdoc in memory structures to man structures, and then in the third step, output the man structures. That would have been more flexible because you could have written a man to man code normalization mode, but the direct way was simpler and so far sufficient for all needs. Um, that was a surprisingly short um, exposition of the of the algorithm, it actually doesn't warrant much more explanation. This is a typical example of a tool that was quite easy to build on top of existing infrastructure on the non-trivial Mandoc puzzle library, but is quite useful and powerful in practice. Actually, I slacked a few years not writing it because I didn't really realize how important it is. The message that Whatever you are writing documentation for, please just use mdoc and then use mandoc to generate the cut pages and the, uh, the classical man pages. It's quite important. OK. Uh, of course, a lot other things were improved in mandoc. In the meantime, it is constantly evolving, in particular, a lot of low-level ROF support. I'm not going through all of this now. Last time I was here, I proposed some goals for the future, so goals from the perspective of 2011. I wanted to install manual sources, not pre-format manuals, during system install. That was done two months after the conference. I wanted to write an mdoc to man parser. That took about one and a half years. I wanted to switch apropos and make what is to the new tool chain. That is done just now. Some things are not yet complete. I talked about a pot to mdoc. But somebody talked about pot. A pot to mdoc converter. Christaps is working on that right now. <laughs> Actually, he's doing it in C, not in Pro. It's crazy, but it works. Um, then, man to mdoc is not yet done, but Christaps is working on it too. And um, one of the next things to do, admittedly, I already promised that last time, is to improve the man CGI on the website so that you, you can use this functionality. Um, another thing that I didn't talk about last time, but that came up in the meantime, is we should really integrate the pre-conf tool into the mandoc binary. That would considerably help with formatting manuals translated to languages that don't use ASCII character sets, like Japanese man pages or Russian man pages. Um, the point in, in 
What Christoph is doing now with docbook to mdoc is that you, when you chain it up with doclifter, the tool by Eric Raymond, is that you can support transitions from MAN to mdoc. So if people have software having MAN pages now, they can run doclifter on it, convert it to docbook format, run docbook to mdoc on it, and then they have a starting point for cleaning up the mdoc code and can do the next release with mdoc pages. But that needs work. That's, that's for the future. And pod to mdoc has two applications. One is the LibreSSL Valhalla Rampage. Uh, we, have, we have two or three volunteers in OpenBSD to run that thing on the OpenSSL main pages, convert them to mdoc, clean them up manually, and then we can hope that the developers like Beck and Tido and whoever, uh, Mio, will also improve the manual pages while working on the code. We cannot really hope they do that as long as it's pod. But if pod to mdoc gets good enough, we might replace the entry pod to man with pod to mdoc, and then we would get semantic searching for facilities over Perl manuals would be awesome. Admittedly, I'm not yet sure whether that can really be done. It's just ideas for the future. And the, from my personal perspective, the most interesting thing would be to unify the parsers. The problem is we, have, we now have three completely distinct parsers, a ROF parser, a MAN parser, an MDOC parser. The ROF parser is purely a preprocessor. It doesn't create, well, it creates almost no data structure. In particular, it creates no syntax nodes. Which, and the syntax nodes created um, by the MAN and MDOC parsers are structs of different content, different format. So we have the ridiculous situation that the, the low-level ROF requests break line and vertical spacing are implemented twice both in the MAN and in the MDOC parsers, because they need to... And that's, that's a major roadblock for improving low-level rough functionality. So if we ever want to get close to, complete, uh, to a complete NROF implementation in MANDOC, we, well, people are using that stuff. So it, is, it sounds crazy, but it is not completely useless. We have to unify the parsers, but that's, of course, a, a large work because it will change the basic structures, the basic data structures that goes everywhere in the program. At which point will we name the project OpenGraph? <laughs> I don't think uh, we will rename. We have come to like the name Mandoc. <laughs> Besides, it would not be open off. Yeah, okay, who contributed? Uh, the, the top contributor, of course, is Christaps Johnsons, the original author of Mandoc. But in the meantime, considerable code contributions have also, also come in from a few guys from Dragonfly and NetBSD, Franco, Jörg, Christos, Tsugotoro Muinami, um, very important is that Mark Espy has done the OpenBSD ports integration. Without that, we would not have been able to, again, to go forward in the first place. And on, on everything that was really dangerous and difficult, he has pro provided invaluable feedback and testing. Jason McIntyre, I can't count how often I have talked to Jason McIntyre, the OpenBSD man page maintainer. Uh, about all kinds of things. The guy who fixes all of that. Yes, right. Uh, PKG source porting is now maintained. It was originally set up by Jörg, but is now maintained by Thomas Klausner, with at NetBSD, who is also very helpful, also with porting to other operating systems. In FreeBSD, the guy doing what Thomas Klausner is doing for PKG source and NetBSD is Ulrich Spörlein. That's also the one who need to talk to if you want to enable this stuff in FreeBSD. Also, Ulrich sent in a large number of bug reports. I actually have to acknowledge work of 
GNU people here. Werner Lemberg of the GNU Trough project was very helpful. He has merged quite some patches I have sent to Groff in order to keep Mandoc and Groff parallel and not let them drift apart and become incompatible. Um, Anthony Bentley has helped uh, porting various software to OpenBSD that is needed for comparisons and he also sent in lots of bug reports. There are many people who ported to other operating systems. Of course, Todd has done a lot of work testing and even providing multiple patches to the MDoc to MAN converter. And then Jeremy Evans was very helpful with SQLite database optimization because SQL is not really my specialty. Christian Weisgerber, Nadi at OpenBSD, has done for three years continuous work on getting more and more ports use Mandoc. Stuart is, of course, the one who helps with any porting issues. He has, he has helped a lot of time. And Pascal Stumpf helped with various difficult graph porting issues. Of course, I need to keep graph running on OpenBSD. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm doing. We, we must not drift apart. And there are lots and lots of other people who helped in various respects. Also, quite a few from, from NetBSD and Dragonfly. Yeah. So any more questions? Well, that's what the NetBSD does. Um, it may be a way to do it. Actually, that might be one way the Mandoc, apropos, and MacWordis could go to adopt on top of what we have now. Also, a category for unmarked text, which would amount to that. But I would have to check how big the database becomes and what the parsing times on VAX will be afterwards. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we are supporting the operating system on various architectures. And we want to make sure that it really works. Of course, reading the K-shell manual on VAX is slow. You have to wait about 30 seconds for the K-shell manual to format on VAX but it is still usable. If apropos would take half an hour to tell you whether something is in that page or not, that would no longer be useful. Yes, so some checks have to be done there. Maybe it must be optional, whatever, we, we would have to check. Yeah, so I could show you how the, because you asked for that, how the, a pot to man output looks like less, yeah. Yes, move it to the other side. Good idea. Yeah, like that. Okay, so I say less man minus v per. So this is this, well, not really the source code. Um, this is the intermediate format generated by pot to man that is, to be, that is supposed to be man source code. However, if you look at it, it says define macros, then it has if statements. It has, uh, yeah, it's, it's mo mostly string definitions. Here is character translations. Here is an if and an else. So it's most of this preamble, it goes, for, goes on for lines and lines. Here you have uh, nested if statements. It's all low-level rough code. Mando uh, looks, looks very nice, this rough code, with uh, various escape sequences. Mando can handle all that. Um, still, the quality of the searching in this thing is governed by these, by these man macros, which don't really support semantic searching. 
So it would be useful to run pot to man instead on it. Let me see whether I find the manual locate Perl pot less well it's it doesn't really matter which one I take. Let's take this one. So here you have the, the pot format. That's the original one. Now this is dangerous. I run pot to mdoc on it. Maybe with less. Okay, so that's the new tool Christops had, has written in a few days. What does it say? You see the typical, the typical mdoc preamble? The, the synopsis is not really yet as it should be because it's still, well, it's, it's using some semantic markup here. It's talking about flags. There it's talking about arguments, but much of it is still um, is still um, presentational markup. But even the bit of semantic markup that is already in it could already help if it goes into the database. So, yeah, work in progress, exactly. Any more questions that came up in the meantime? No? Then I thank you for uh, your attention and the various discussions. Quite interesting for me too. And enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.